The Big Pet Cat by David Wilson. Coffee Break Collection 36. Cats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Big Pet Cat. One evening in the 90s, I went to dine at the house of a friend in Burma and was unexpectedly greeted at the entrance by a leopard almost fully grown. He received me with the same restful manner of dignified armed neutrality that may be seen on the features of a domestic cat or of an old family servant observing a strange visitor. Do the others know, I asked the host, meaning the other dinner guests not yet arrived. Yes, they all know him, but none of them like him or maybe it is that he does not like them. I don't know exactly what is the matter. He seems to feel by instinct that you are a friend. Dear old fellow. And the big cat laid its head confidentially on his thigh, and rolled its eyes dubiously in the way cats do, while a fat hand caressed its fine fur tenderly, lovingly. It'll be rare fun to see the rest arrive. It was indeed a pleasant entertainment to see that bachelor's house being entered as if a very distinguished hostess were receiving the visitors. The sight of Mr. Spots made the most free and easy a little constrained in manner. They kept their eyes upon him, and as he moved about at his ease, they made way for him with an agility of quick politeness more common in Frenchmen than in Englishmen. But though he engrossed their conversation as much as their thoughts, there was a lack of heartiness in their appreciation which seemed to sadden their host. He tried to keep the fine animal beside himself. Pets should always be young and growing creatures, he said, as he scratched its head, and with many mingled puffs and sighs, went on to say, they are a nuisance when they grow up. You lose their affection, you see. Women are just the same. This beautiful beast does not heed me now, and at one time no puppy could be fonder. He would lie on his back to be tickled by a straw, and play with me by the hour. He hardly ever snarled, even at the servants. Look at him. The gentle beast was made to show his teeth and opened a capacious mouth. Yes, indeed, said one. I've done nothing but look at him since I came in, and have had my hand on my pistol already once. He won't hurt you. He's had his dinner. Another visitor sent his dog home and opportunely remarked that as leopards were fond of eating dogs, they felt at home with humanity as lions or tigers never could. It was hunger only that made these bigger beasts eat men. The normal tiger or lion would run away from a child, or at any rate pass it by. But even a well-fed leopard might take to long pig, meaning humanity, in simple wantonness for a change. I hope he always has plenty of salt with his food, said one. Might I tell the boy to fetch some for him now? Why, in all the world? Because it is the salt in human flesh that is said to be the great attraction. You don't suppose my leopard spends his time in studying chemistry, do you? I tell you he would not eat you if you offered yourself. His belly's full. Mr. Spots yawned and looked round the company with an air of royal indifference. His master continued to scratch his head. In obedience to a gesture, he submitted quietly when a servant fastened a chain on his neck, and reluctantly but unresistingly he let himself be led away. I'm very sorry, said his master, looking after him affectionately, almost as if apologizing to the pet. That's what is hurting his feelings, he explained to us. What? The chain, the restriction, the want of confidence is spoiling his fine temper. After a pause, he added, as I was saying, it's the lapse of time. Pets should always be adolescent, and women, too. Not women, protested one, who quoted, Age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. It's not variety that I want, cried he. I hate change. I would like my pets never to grow up. It's the change I object to. It's horrid, these transfers. Hello, are you transferred, we cried, more interested than surprised for as readers are probably aware, the Europeans of every kind in the East are at the best respectable vagabonds, globetrotters by trade, and only a few derelicts who are settling down to die can have a fixed abode. Transferred? No, no, I don't mean that. 
I was thinking of transfers of affection, he explained, and he proceeded to discuss the claims of various zoos and the chance of poor Mr. Spots being more happy in one than another, like a mother discussing her daughter's suitors. Amidst the merriment that arose when all constraint was ended, he was advised to wed and seemed to take the advice most seriously. He did send away the leopard and did take a wife not long afterwards, and as he was a good-hearted man, I believe she is a happy woman, but she little suspects who was her predecessor in her husband's affections. End of The Big Pet Cat by David Wilson Chapter 7 Caliban from Surprise House by Abby Farwell Brown Coffee Break Collection 36 Cats This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winifred Asman Chapter 7 Caliban With rosy cheeks and sparkling eyes, Mary returned from a walk with Katie Summers. It had been pleasant but uneventful. Just as she turned in at the little dooryard of home, she thought she spied a black something dart like a shadow across the little strip of green beside the house. It looks like a cat, said Mary to herself. I will see where it went to. She followed to the end of the house where the shape had seemed to disappear. There was nothing to be seen. She went around the L and back to the front of the house again. Still, there was no trace of the little shadow that had streaked into invisibility. If it was not my imagination, it must have gone under the house, said Mary to herself. Two or three times I have thought I spied a black blur in the act of disappearing, and I believe we are haunted by something on four legs. I will ask the family. That night at the supper table she broached the question. Mother, have you seen a cat about the place? A black cat? A swift cat? A cat that never stays for a second in one spot? A mysterious cat that is gone as soon as you see it? That sounds spooky enough, commented Dr. Corliss. You make the shivers run down my sensitive spine. I have not seen any cat, said Mrs. Corliss. I think you must be mistaken, Mary. Yes, I've seen a cat, volunteered John. A thin black cat. Oh, so thin. I saw him run across the lawn once, and once I saw him crouching down by the lilac bush near the back door. I think he was catching mice. Then there is a cat, said Mary. I thought I might be dreaming. He must be very wild. I believe he lives under our house. Under the house, exclaimed Mrs. Corliss. Surely we should all have seen him if he lived so near. I can't think he could have escaped my eyes. But now, I remember, I have heard strange noises in the cellar once or twice. I have often, said Mary, under my library. Maybe it is a witch cat, suggested Dr. Corliss, pretending to look frightened. You people are all so fond of poetry and ravens and mystery and magics. You attract strange doings, you see. Maybe Aunt Nan had a witch cat who helped her play tricks on the ever-to-be-surprised world. Daddy, cried John, there's no such thing as a witch cat. Is there truly? Of course not, laughed his mother. Daddy is only joking. And now I come to think of it, I have wondered why the scraps I put out for the birds always vanished so quickly. A hungry cat prowling about would explain everything. It might be Aunt Nan's cat, said Mary thoughtfully. Poor thing. He might have run away when he couldn't find Aunt Nan any more. He might have been frightened and have hid under the house. I think in that case he would have starved to death in all these weeks, said Mrs. Corliss. Besides, I should think the neighbors would have told us, or that Aunt Nan herself would have left some word. I'm going to find out if I can, said Mary. If it's Aunt Nan's cat, I want to be good to him. We want to be good to him anyway, don't we? Of course we do, said Mrs. Corliss. 
but there is nothing so hard to tame as a wild cat. Katie Summers knew nothing of any cat belonging to Miss Scorless. Neither did the other neighbors. That next day, on coming home from school, Mary again spied the cat. Just as she clicked the gate, she saw the long black shape scurry across the lawn and vanish under the L, under Mary's library. Mary tiptoed to the house and, stooping, called gently, Kitty, kitty, kitty. At first there was no response. But presently there came a feeble and doleful meow. And Mary thought she could catch the gleam of two green eyes glaring out of the darkness. I must get him something to eat, said Mary. Perhaps I can tempt him to make friends. And running into the house, she returned with a saucer of milk and a bit of meat, which she set down close to the house. Kitty, 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 she called in a tone of invitation. Meow, cried the forlorn cat again, but he did not come forth from his hiding place. I shall have to go away and give him a chance to eat when I am not by, thought Mary, and this she did. From her chamber window, she could just manage to watch the hole under the L. After a long time, she was rewarded by seeing the cat's head emerge from the hole. For a minute, he stared around with wild eyes, his body ready to spring. But finding himself safe, he hungrily seized the meat and retreated with it under the house. Presently, he came out again, licking his chops eagerly, and began to lap the milk, retreating every now and then, as if some fancied sound alarmed him. The poor creature's sides were so thin that he resembled a cut-out pasteboard cat. His tail was like that of a long black rat. He seemed to be wearing a collar about his neck. He must have been somebody's pet cat, said Mary to herself. I must try to tame him. But it took a great deal of time and patience to make friends with the poor black pussy which had evidently been greatly frightened and almost starved. Day after day, Mary set out the saucer of milk and a bit of meat, and each time she did so, she talked kindly to the cat hidden under the house, hoping that he would come out while she was still there. But it was many days before she got more than the mournful meow in answer to her coaxing words. At last, one day, after waiting a long time beside the saucer of milk and a particularly savory plate of chicken bones, Mary was rewarded by seeing the cat timidly thrust out his head while she was talking. He drew back almost immediately, but finally the smell of the chicken tempted him beyond caution, and he got up courage to face this stranger who seemed to show no evil intentions. He snatched a chicken bone and vanished. But this was the beginning of friendship. The next day the cat came out almost immediately when Mary called him. Presently he would take things from her hand, timidly at first, then with increasing confidence, when he found that nothing dreadful happened. But still Mary had no chance to examine the collar, on which she saw that there were some words engraved. At last came a day when the cat let Mary stroke his fur, now grown much sleeker and covering a plumper body. And from that time it became easier to make friends. Soon Mary held the creature on her lap for a triumphant minute, and the next day she had a chance to examine the engraved collar. On the silver plate was traced Caliban, home of N. Corliss, Crowfield. He was Aunt Nan's cat, cried Mary in excitement and she ran into the house with the news. Mrs. Corliss was astonished. We must make Caliban feel at home again, she said. He must have had a terrible fright, but we will help him to forget that before long. In a little while, Mary succeeded in coaxing Caliban into the house, and once inside, he did not behave like a stranger. For a few moments, indeed, he hesitated, cringing as if in fear of what might happen. But presently he raised his head, sniffed, and looking neither to right nor left, marched straight toward the library. Mary tiptoed after him in great excitement. Caliban went directly to the big armchair beside the desk, sniffed a moment at the cushion, then jumped up and curled himself down for a nap, 
giving a great sigh of contentment. From that moment, he accepted partnership with Mary in the room and all its contents. "'Well, I never!' cried Mrs. Corliss, who had followed softly. "'The cat is certainly at home. "'I wonder how he ever happened to go away. "'I suppose we shall never know.' "'And they never did. "'They made inquiries of the neighbours, "'but nobody could tell them anything definite "'about Aunt Nan's cat. "'Some persons had, indeed, "'seen a big black creature "'stalking about the lawn in the old lady's time, "'and had not liked the look of him, as they said. "'But as Miss Corliss had never had anything to do with her neighbours, "'so her cat seemed to have followed her example. "'And when Aunt Nan's day was over, the cat simply disappeared. "'Caliban must have lived precariously by catching mice and birds, "'but he never deserted the neighbourhood of the old house "'when the new tenants came to live there, "'though it took him some time to realise "'that these were relatives of his mistress whom he might trust. "'Once more an inmate of the house, Caliban never wandered again. He adopted Mary as his new mistress and allowed her to take all kinds of liberties with him. But to the rest of the family he was always rather haughty and standoffish. John never quite got rid of the idea that Caliban was a witch cat, and sometimes he had a rather creepy feeling when the great black cat blinked at him with his green eyes. But Mary said it was all nonsense. He's just a dear, good, soft pussy cat," she cried one day, hugging the now plump and handsome Caliban in her arms. And Caliban, stretching out a soft paw, laid it lovingly against his little mistress's cheek. But John vowed that at the same moment Caliban winked wickedly at him. End of chapter 7 Caliban by Abby Farwell Brown The Cat Came Back by Virginia West. Coffee Break Collection 36. Cats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Merritt. The Cat Came Back. Leonard Raymond was temperamentally a naturalist. Had circumstances not compelled him to make a living, he would no doubt have been an Audubon or a Gray. He spent his spare moments studying the habits of the living things about town. English sparrows, pigeons, stray cats, homeless dogs, and so forth. Old man Peterkin, whose wife kept the boarding house at which Raymond was getting his meals, who did nothing but collect the board bills, grow fat, and hold the position of church deacon, had told him that the crows in the cupola of the Utah Place Synagogue had been nesting there for eleven years. Raymond did not know whether to regard that as an interesting item about crows, or as evidence against Mr. Peterkin's veracity. However, Mr. Peterkin and the crows have nothing to do with this story. In the back yard of the Linden Avenue house, in which he lived with his married sister, Raymond raised flowers, and on Sundays and holidays he would often go to the country to study the wild flowers and the birds. One summer evening he sat in the back yard among the flowers. He was hot and lonesome, the thermometer being close to ninety. The family being out of town, and no vacation for himself in sight. Tomorrow, he reflected, he would return to his post of teller in the bank and hand out more money than he would ever own in a lifetime. The day after, he would do the same thing. His melancholy reflections were broken in upon by what seemed to be a ball of fire on top of the tall board fence. In an instant, it disappeared, and he saw the long black form of a cat slide down the fence and light in the yard. The beast went to a garbage can in the corner of the yard, sniffed about it, observed that the lid was on, and then, turning the gleaming ball upon Raymond, sprang up the fence and disappeared. The same thing happened the next evening. On the third evening, when the cat appeared, 
Raymond advanced cautiously and tried to be friendly. The cat hesitated, but when the man's hand was almost on him, he streaked up and over the fence. The following evening, when Raymond walked uptown from the bank, as he approached Richmond Market, he thought of the cat, and stopping at a stall, bought a small portion of meat. The meat was put on the ground near the fence, on which, at the regular time, the cat appeared. The eye gleamed. Raymond was wondering why both eyes did not gleam when the cat seemed to fall straight down upon the meat. Raymond sat as still as a stone and heard the meat crunching between the cat's jaws. The animal was licking its chops when he advanced. It met him halfway, and while Raymond rubbed his fur, the cat purred. Sitting down upon a bench, the cat leaped into his lap, curled up, and settled down for a nap. Then it was that he found about the cat's neck a small chain with a tag on it. When he went into the house, the cat followed him, and by the gaslight he read on the tag a Madison Avenue address. Also, he observed that the cat had but one eye, and forthwith he christened him Cyclops. He wondered why a person who thought enough of the cat to provide him with a chain and tag should have left him to search for his victuals in alleys and backyards like an ordinary stray. Cyclops stuck by Raymond like a twin brother, and every evening when Raymond came from business, he stopped in Richmond Market and bought meat for Cyclops. One day the man in the stall asked him if he were a family man. One Sunday morning, Raymond strolled across Utah Place and up to the Madison Avenue address. The house was closed for the summer, but the policeman on the post told him who lived there. Summer was nearly at an end when Raymond happened to see in the paper that the people at the Madison Avenue house had returned to town. Now, Raymond was an honest man. Had he been anything else, he would not have been allowed to handle the bank's money. So on Saturday evening, with Cyclops under his arm, he sadly went up Madison Avenue to return the cat to his lawful owner. Boys on the street made personal remarks about the man and the cat, and Cyclops' great eye turned green with wrath as he glared at them. A colored woman of the mammy type answered his ring. She looked and gasped. Before Raymond could explain, she thrust her head into the hall and shouted in strident tones, Come here, Miss Liza. Bless the Lord, if here ain't yo cat. In a moment appeared the prettiest girl that Raymond's eyes had ever rested upon. She had blue eyes and a mass of golden hair. Though comparatively young and quite in the eligible class, Raymond was not a ladies' man. With much embarrassment, he told the history of the cat. While she held Cyclops to her bosom, the girl explained that she had left him with a friend to keep for her during the summer, and he had run away. She had given him up for lost. "'Dat cat know what he doin', snickered the mammy, who was standing back in the hall. "'Dat cat can see further than you can, if he ain't got but one eye.' Raymond went off catless. All the way home he was thinking of a way by which he might call on the beautiful Miss Liza. Sunday afternoon, he went out to the country, to the woods, the flowers, the birds, and his soul was full of poetry and his mind of thoughts of the girl. That evening, old Cyclops was back on the fence, his great eye had a gleam of mischievousness. Down the fence he slid, and straight to Raymond, who decided that he must take the cat back to his owner immediately. While Cyclops prowled about the parlor, with tail erect, rubbing against every article of furniture, Raymond talked to Miss Liza. Every evening, Cyclops returned to Raymond, and every evening, he as promptly took him home. 
Thus time passed from autumn into early winter. One evening, sitting before a little wood fire in her parlor, Raymond said to Miss Liza, I don't see but one way to keep our cat in one place. Then Miss Liza blushed and said she didn't see but one way either. Then he kissed her, and old Cyclops rubbed against both of them and purred to beat the band. End of The Cat Came Back by Virginia West The Cats of Old Thar by H. P. Lovecraft Coffee Break Collection 36 Cats This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caveat. It is said that in Ulthar, which lies beyond the river sky, no man may kill a cat. And this I can verily believe as I gaze upon him who sitteth purring before the fire. For the cat is cryptic and close to strange things which men cannot see. He is the soul of antique Egypt and the bearer of tales from forgotten cities of Moreau and Orphia. He is the kin of the jungle lords, and heir to the secrets of hoary and sinister Africa. The Sphinx is his cousin, and he speaks her language. But he is more ancient than the Sphinx, and remembers that which she hath forgotten. In Ulthar, before ever the Burgesses forbade the killing of cats, there dwelt an old cotter and his wife, who delighted to trap and slay the cats of their neighbours, why they did this I know not, save that many hate the voice of the cat in the night, and take it ill that cats should run stealthily about yards and gardens at twilight. But whatever the reason, this old man and woman took pleasure in trapping and slaying every cat which came near to their hovel, and from some of the sounds heard after dark, many villagers fancied that the manner of slaying was exceedingly peculiar. But the villagers did not discuss such things with the old man and his wife, because of the habitual expression on the withered faces of the two, and because their cottage was so small and so darkly hidden, under spreading oaks at the back of a neglected yard. In truth, much as the owners of cats hated these odd folk, they feared them more and instead of berating them as brutal assassins, many took care that no cherished pet or mouser should stray toward the remote hovel under the dark trees. When through some unavoidable oversight a cat was missed, and sounds heard after dark, the loser would lament impotently or console himself by thanking fate that it was not one of his children who had thus vanished. For the people of Ulthar were simple, and knew not whence it is that all cats first came. One day a caravan of strange wanderers from the south entered the narrow, cobbled streets of Ulthar. Dark wanderers they were, and unlike the other roving folk who passed through the village twice every year, in the village marketplace, they told fortunes for silver and bought gay beads from the merchants. What was the land of these wanderers none could tell. But it was seen that they were given to strange prayers, and that they painted on the sides of their wagons strange figures with human bodies, and heads of cats, hawks, rams, and lions. And the leader of the caravan wore a headdress with two horns and a curious disc betwixt the horns. There was in this singular caravan a little boy with no father or mother, but only a tiny black kitten to cherish. The plague had not been kind to him, yet had left him this small furry thing to mitigate his sorrow, and when one is very young, one can find great relief in the lively antics of a black kitten. So the boy, whom the dark people called Menes, smiled more often than he wept as he sat playing with his graceful kitten on the steps of an oddly painted wagon. On the third morning of the wanderer's stay in Ulthar, Menes could not find his kitten, and as he sobbed aloud in the marketplace, certain villagers told him of the old man and his wife, and of the sounds heard in the night. And when he heard these things, his sobbing gave place to meditation, and finally to prayer. 
he stretched out his arms towards the sun, and prayed in a tongue no villager could understand, though indeed the villagers did not try very hard to understand, since their attention was mostly taken up by the sky, and the odd shapes the clouds were assuming. It was very peculiar, but as the little boy uttered his petition, there seemed to form overhead, in the shadowy, nebulous figures of exotic things, of hybrid creatures crowned with horned, flanked discs. Nature is full of such illusions to impress the imaginative. That night, the wanderers left Ulthar and were never seen again, and the householders were troubled when they noticed that in all the village there was not a cat to be found. From each hearth the familiar cat had vanished, cats large and small, black, grey, striped, yellow and white. Old Crannon, the burgomaster, swore that the dark folk had taken the cats away, in revenge for the killing of many's kitten, and cursed the caravan and the little boy. But Nith, the lean notary, declared that the old cotter and his wife were more likely persons to suspect, for the hatred of cats was notorious and increasingly bold. Still, no one durst complain to the sinister couple. Even when little Attle, the innkeeper's son, vowed that he had at twilight seen all the cats of Ulthar in that accursed yard under the trees, pacing very slowly and solemnly in a circle around the cottage, two abreast, as if in performance of some unheard-of rite of beasts, the villagers did not know how much to believe from so small a boy though they feared that the evil pair had charmed the cats to their death, and they preferred not to chide the old cotter till they met him outside his dark and repellent yard. So Ulthar went to sleep in vain anger, and when the people awakened at dawn, behold, every cat was back at his accustomed hearth, large and small, black, grey, striped, yellow and white, none was missing. Very sleek and fat did the cats appear, and sonorous with purring content. The citizens talked with one another of the affair and marvelled not a little. Old Cranon again insisted it was the dark folk who had taken them, since cats did not return alive from the cottage of the ancient man and his wife. But all agreed on one thing, that the refusal of all the cats to eat their portions of meat or drink their sources of milk was exceedingly curious and for two whole days the sleek, lazy cats of Ulthar would touch no food, but only doze by the fire or in the sun. It was fully a week before the villagers noticed that no lights were appearing at dusk in the windows of the cottage under the trees. Then the lean Nith remarked that no one had seen the old man or his wife since the night the cats were away. In another week the burgomaster decided to overcome his fears and call at the strangely silent dwelling as a matter of duty, though in doing so he was careful to take with him Shang, the blacksmith, and Thul, the cutter of stone, as witnesses. And when they had broken down the frail door, they found only this. Two cleanly picked human skeletons on the earthen floor, and the number of singular beetles crawling in the shadowy corners. There was subsequently much talk amongst the burgesses of Ulthar. Zath, the coroner disputed at length with Nith, the lean notary, and Cranon and Shang and Thol were overwhelmed with questions. Even little Atoll, the innkeeper's son, was closely questioned, and given a sweetmeat as reward. They talked of the old cutter and his wife, of the caravan of the dark wanderers, of small Menes and his black kitten, of the prayer of Menes and of the sky during that prayer, of the doings of the cats on the night the caravan left and of what was later found in the cottage under the dark trees in the repellent yard. And in the end, the Burgesses passed that remarkable law, which is told of by traders in Hathog, and discussed by travellers in Nier, namely, that in Ulthar, no man may kill a cat. End of The Cats of Ulthar by H. P. Lovecraft Dame Trot and Her Cat by Anonymous. Coffee Break Collection number 36. Cats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Wilcox Baird. 
Dame Trot and Her Cat by Anonymous. Dame Trot once went to a neighboring fair, and what do you think that she bought herself there? A pussy, the prettiest ever was seen. No cat was so gentle, so clever, and clean. Each dear little paw was as black as a slow. The rest of her fur was as white as the snow. Her eyes were bright green, and her sweet little face was pretty and meek, full of innocent grace. Dame Trot hurried home with this beautiful cat, went upstairs to take off her cloak and her hat, and when she came down was astonished to see that pussy was busy preparing the tea. Oh, what a strange cat, thought poor little Dame Trot. She'll break my best china and upset the pot. But no harm befell them. The velvety paws were quite sure the dame for alarm had no cause. Next morning, when little Dame Trot came downstairs to attend as usual to household affairs, she found that the kitchen was swept up as clean as if Puss, a regular servant, had been. The tea stood to draw, and the toast was done brown. The dame, very pleased, to her breakfast sat down, while Puss by her side on an armchair sat up and lapped her warm milk from a nice china cup. Now Spot, the old house dog, looked on in amaze. He'd never been used to such queer cattish ways. But Puss mewed so sweetly and moved with such grace that Spot at last liked her and licked her white face. The dame went to market and left them alone, Puss washing her face, the dog picking a bone. But when she came back, Spot was learning to dance from Pussy, who once had had lessons in France. Poor little Dame Trot had no money to spare, and only too often her cupboard was bare. Then kind Mrs. Pussy would catch a nice fish and serve it for dinner upon a clean dish. The rats and the mice who wish pussy to please were now never seen at the butter or cheese. The dame daily found their numbers grow thinner, for puss at a mouse every day for her dinner. If puss had a weakness, I needs must confess, t'was a girl of the period's fancy for dress. Her greatest desire, a high chignon and hat, and a very short dress a la mode for a cat. So one day when Dame Trot had gone out to dine, Puss dressed herself up as she thought very fine, and coaxed kind old Spot, who looked at her with pride, to play pony for once and give her a ride. The dame from her visit returning home late met this funny couple outside her own gate, and heartily laughed when she saw her dear cat dressed up in a cloak and a chignon and hat. "'You're quite a grand lady, Miss Pussy,' said she." and Pussy affectedly answered, wee wee. She thought it beneath her to mutter a mew while wearing a dress of a fashion so new. Now Spot, who to welcome his mistress desired and to company manners never aspired, jumped up to fawn on her, and down came the cat and crushed in her tumble her feather and hat. Oh, Puss, said Dame Trot, what a very sad mess, you'd best have remained in your natural dress the graces which nature so kindly bestows are more often hid than improved by fine clothes end of dame trot and her cat by anonymous dame wiggins of lee and her seven wonderful cats a humorous tale by richard scrafton sharp and mrs pearson Coffee Break Collection, 36. Cats. Dame Wiggins of Lee was a worthy old soul, as e'er threaded a needle or washed in a bowl. She held mice and rats in such antipathy that seven fine cats kept Dame Wiggins of Lee. The rats and mice, scared by this fierce whiskered crew, the poor seven cats soon had nothing to do. So, as any one idle, she never loved to see she sent them to school did dame wiggins of lee but soon she grew tired of living alone so she sent for her cats from school to come home each rowing a wary returning you see the frolic made merry dame wiggins of lee the dame was quite pleased and ran out to market when she came back they were mending the carpet the needle each handled as brisk as a bee well done my good cats said dame wiggins of lee to give them a treat she ran out for some rice when she came back they were skating on ice i shall soon see one down i perhaps two or three i'll bet half a crown said dame wiggins of lee while to make a nice pudding she went for a sparrow they were wheeling a sick lamb home in a barrow 
you shall all have some sprats for your humanity my seven good cats said dame wiggins of lee while she ran to the field to look for its dam they were warming the bed for the poor sick lamb they turned up the clothes all as neat as could be i shall ne'er want a nurse said dame wiggins of lee she wished them good night and went up to bed when lo in the morning the cats were all fled but soon what a fuss where can they all be here pussy puss puss cried dame wiggins of lee the dame's heart was nigh broke so she sat down to weep when she saw them come back each riding a sheep she fondled and patted each purring tummy ah welcome my dears said dame wiggins of lee the dame was unable her pleasure to smother to see the sick lamb jump up to its mother in spite of the gout and a pain in her knee she went dancing about did dame wiggins of lee the farmer soon heard where his sheep went astray and arrived at dame's door with his faithful dog tray he knocked with his crook and the stranger to see out of window did look dame wiggins of lee for their kindness he had them all drawn by his team and gave them some field mice and raspberry cream said he all my stock ye shall presently see for i honour the cats of dame wiggins of lee he sent his maid out for some muffins and crumpets and when he turned round they were blowing of trumpets said he i suppose she's as deaf as can be or this ne'er could be borne by dame wiggins of lee to show them his poultry he turned them all loose when each nimbly leaped on the back of a goose which frightened them so that they ran to the sea and half drowned the poor cats of dame wiggins of lee for the care of his lamb and their comical pranks he gave them a ham and abundance of thanks i wish you good day my fine fellows said he my compliments pray to dame wiggins of lee you see them arrived at their dame's welcome door they show her their presence and all their good store now come in to supper and sit down with me all welcome once more cried dame wiggins of lee end of dame wiggins of lee and her seven wonderful cats a humorous tale by richard scrafton sharp and mrs pearson read by elsie selwyn this librivox recording is in the public domain dick baker's cat by mark twain coffee break collection thirty six cats this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org dick baker's cat one of my comrades there another of those victims of eighteen years of unrequited toil and blighted hopes was one of the gentlest spirits that ever bore its patient cross on a weary exile grave and simple dick baker pocket miner of dead horse gulch he was forty-six gray as a rat earnest thoughtful slenderly educated slouchily dressed and clay soiled but his heart was finer metal than any gold his shovel ever brought to light and any indeed that ever was mined or minted whenever he was out of luck and a little downhearted he would fall to mourning over the loss of a wonderful cat he used to own for where women and children are not men of kindly impulses take up with pets for they must love something and he always spoke of the strange sagacity of that cat with an air of a man who believed in his secret heart that there was something human about it maybe even supernatural i heard him talking about this animal once he said gentlemen i used to have a cat here by the name of tom quartz which you'd a took an interest in i reckon most anybody would i had him here eight year and he was the remarkablest cat i ever see he was a large gray one of the tom species and he had more hard natural sense than any man in this camp and a power of dignity he wouldn't let the governor of california be familiar with him he never catched a rat in his life appeared to be above it he never cared for nothing but mining he knowed more about mining that cat did than any man i ever ever see you couldn't tell him nothing about placer diggings and as for pocket mining why he was just born for it 
he would dig out after me and Jim when we went over the hills prospecting, and he would trot along behind us for as much as five mile if we went so fur, and he had the best judgment about mining ground. Why, you never seen anything like it. When we went to work, he'd scatter a glance around, and if he didn't think much of the indications, he would give a look as much as to say, Well, I'll have to get you to excuse me. And without another word, he'd hoist his nose into the air and shove for home. But if the ground suited him, he would lay low and keep dark until the first pan was washed. And then he would sidle up and take a look. And if there was about six or seven grains of gold, he was satisfied. He didn't want no better prospecting than that. And then he would lay down on our coats and snore like a steamboat till we struck the pocket. And then he'd get up and superintend. He was nearly lightning on superintending. Well, by and by, up comes this year quartz excitement. Everybody was into it. Everybody was picking and blasting instead of shoveling dirt on the hillside. Everybody was putting down a shaft instead of scraping the surface. Nothing would do, Jim, but we must tackle the ledges too, and so we did. We commenced putting down a shaft. And Tom Quartz, he began to wonder what in the dickens it was all about. He hadn't ever seen any mining like that before, and he was all upset, as you may say. He couldn't come to a right understanding of it no way. It was too many for him. He was down on it, too, you betcha. He was down on it powerful, and always appeared to consider it the cussedest foolishness out. But that cat, you know, was always again newfangled arrangements. Somehow, he never could abide em. You know how it is with old habits. But by and by, Tom Quartz began to get sort of reconciled a little, though he never could altogether understand that eternal sinking of a shaft and never panning out anything. At last, he got to coming down in the shaft himself, to try to cipher it out, and when he get the blues and feel kind of scruffy and aggravated and disgusted, knowing as he did that the bills was running up all the time and we weren't making a cent, he would curl up on a gunny sack in the corner and go to sleep. Well, one day when the shaft was down about eight foot, the rock got so hard that we had to put in a blast. The first blasting we ever done since Tom Quartz was born. And then we lit the fuse and climb out and got off about fifty yards and forgot and left Tom Quartz sound asleep on the gunny sack. In about a minute we seen a puff of smoke bust up out of the hole, and then everything let go with an awful crash. And about four million ton of rocks and dirt and smoke and splinters shot up about a mile and a half into the air. And by George, right in the dead center of it was old Tom Quartz a going end over end and snorting and sneezing and clawing and reaching for things like all possessed. But it weren't no use, you know. It weren't no use. And that was the last we see of him for about two minutes and a half, and then all of a sudden it began to rain rocks and rubbage, and directly he come down, cur whoop, about ten foot off from where we stood. Well, I reckon he was perhaps the orniest looking beast you ever see. One ear was sought back on his neck, and his tail was stove up, and his eye winkers was singed off and he was all blacked up with powder and smoke and all sloppy with mud and slush from one end to the other. Well, sir, it weren't no use to try to apologize. We couldn't say a word. He took a sort of disgusted look at himself, and then he looked at us. And it was just exactly the same as if he had said, Gents, Maybe you'd think it's smart to take advantage of a cat that ain't had no experience of quartz mining, but I think different. And then he turned on his heel and marched off home without ever saying another word. That was just his style, and maybe you wouldn't believe it, but 
after that you never see a cat so prejudiced agin quartz mining as what he was and by and by when he did get to going down in the shaft again you'd a been astonished at his sagacity the minute we'd tetch off a blast in the fuse begin to sizzle he'd give a look as much as say well i have to get you to excuse me and it was surprising the way he'd shin out of that hole and go for a tree sagacity uh, it ain't no name for it twas inspiration i said well mr baker his prejudice against quartz mining was remarkable considering how he came by it couldn't you ever cure him of it cure him no when tom quartz was sot once he was always sot and you might a blowed him up as much as three million times and you never a broken him of his cussed prejudice agin quartz mining End of Dick Baker's Cat Ode on the Death of a Favourite Cat Drowned in a Tub of Goldfishes By Thomas Gray Coffee Break Collection 36 Cats Reading by Algie Pug T'was on a lofty vase's side where China's gayest art had dyed the azure flowers that blow, demurest of the tabby kind, the pensive Selima reclined, gazed on the lake below. Her conscious tale her joy declared, the fair round face, the snowy beard, the velvet of her paws, her coat that with the tortoise vies, her ears of jet and emerald eyes, she saw and purred applause still had she gazed but midst the tide two angel forms were seen to glide the genii of the stream their scaly armour's tyrian hue through richest purple to the view betrayed a golden gleam the hapless nymph with wonder saw a whisker first and then a claw with many an ardent wish she stretched in vain to reach the prize. What female heart can gold despise? What cats averse to fish? Presumptuous maid, with looks intent, Again she stretched, again she bent, Nor knew the gulf between. Malignant fate sat by and smiled. The slippery verge her feet beguiled. She tumbled headlong in, Eight times emerging from the flood, she mewed to every watery god some speedy aid to send. No dolphin came, no nereid stirred, nor cruel Tom nor Susan heard. A favourite has no friend. From hence ye beauties, undeceived, no, one false step is ne'er retrieved, and be with caution bold. Not all that tempts your wandering eyes and heedless hearts is lawful prize, nor all that glisters gold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Gypsy by Booth Tarkington. Coffee Break Collection 36. Cats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winifred Asman Gypsy On a fair Saturday afternoon in November, Penrod's little old dog Duke returned to the ways of his youth and had trouble with a strange cat on the back porch. This indiscretion, so uncharacteristic, was due to the agitation of a surprised moment, for Duke's experience had inclined him to a peaceful pessimism, and he had no ambition for hazardous undertakings of any sort. He was given to musing, but not to avoidable action, and he seemed habitually to hope for something which he was pretty sure would not happen. Even in his sleep, this gave him an air of wistfulness. Thus, 
being asleep in a nook behind the metal refuse can, when the strange cat ventured to ascend the steps of the porch, his appearance was so unwarlike that the cat felt encouraged to extend its field of reconnaissance, for the cook had been careless, and the backbone of a three-pound whitefish lay at the foot of the refuse can. This cat was, for a cat, needlessly tall, powerful, independent, and masculine. Once, long ago, he had been a roly-poly pepper-and-salt kitten. He had a home in those days and a name, Gypsy, which he abundantly justified. He was precocious in dissipation. Long before his adolescence, his lack of domesticity was ominous, and he had formed bad companionships. Meanwhile, he grew so rangy and developed such length and power of leg and such traits of character that the father of the little girl who owned him was almost convincing when he declared that the young cat was half bronco and half malayed pirate. Though, in the light of Gypsy's later career, this seems bitterly unfair to even the lowest orders of broncos and malay pirates. No, Gypsy was not the pet for a little girl. The rosy hearthstone and sheltered rug were too circumspect for him. Surrounded by the comforts of middle-class respectability, and profoundly oppressed, even in his youth, by the Puritan ideals of the household, he sometimes experienced a sense of suffocation. He wanted free air, and he wanted free life. He wanted the lights, the lights, and the music. He abandoned the bourgeoisie irrevocably. He went forth in a May twilight, carrying the evening beefsteak with him, and joined the underworld. His extraordinary size, his daring, and his utter lack of sympathy soon made him the leader, and, at the same time, the terror of all the loose-lived cats in a wide neighborhood. He contracted no friendships and had no confidants. He seldom slept in the same place twice in succession, and though he was wanted by the police, he was not found. In appearance, he did not lack distinction of an ominous sort. The slow, rhythmic, perfectly controlled mechanism of his tail as he impressively walked abroad, was incomparably sinister. This stately and dangerous walk of his, his long, vibrant whiskers, his scars, his yellow eye, so ice-cold, so fire-hot, haughty as the eye of Satan, gave him the deadly air of a mousquetaire duelist. His soul was in that walk and in that eye. It could be read, the soul of a bravo of fortune, living on his wits and his valor, asking no favors and granting no quarter. Intolerant, proud, sullen, yet watchful and constantly planning, purely a militarist, believing in slaughter as in a religion, and confident that art, science, poetry, and the good of the world were happily advanced thereby. Gypsy had become, though technically not a wild cat, undoubtedly the most untamed cat at large in the civilized world. Such, in brief, was the terrifying creature which now elongated its neck and, over the top step of the porch, bent a calculating scrutiny upon the wistful and slumberous duke. The scrutiny was searching but not prolonged. Gypsy muttered contemptuously to himself, Oh, Shoal, I'm not afraid of that and he approached the fishbone, his padded feet making no noise upon the boards. It was a desirable fishbone, large, with a considerable portion of the fish's tail still attached to it. It was about a foot from Duke's nose, and the little dog's dreams began to be troubled by his olfactory nerve. This faithful sentinel, on guard even while Duke slept, signaled that alarums and excursions by parties unknown were taking place and suggested that attention might well be paid. Duke opened one drowsy eye. What that eye beheld was monstrous. Here was a strange experience, the horrific vision in the midst of things so accustomed. Sunshine fell sweetly upon porch and backyard. Yonder was the familiar stable, and from its interior came the busy hum of a carpenter shop, established that morning by Duke's young master, 
in association with Samuel Williams and Herman. Here, close by, were the quiet refuse can and the wanted brooms and mops leaning against the latticed wall at the end of the porch, and there, by the foot of the steps, was the stone slab of the cistern, with the iron cover displaced and lying beside the round opening where the carpenters had left it not half an hour ago, after lowering a stick of wood into the water to season it. All about Duke were these usual and reassuring environs of his daily life, and yet it was his fate to behold, right in the midst of them, and in ghastly juxtaposition to his face, a thing of nightmare and lunacy. Gypsy had seized the fishbone by the middle. Out from one side of his head, and mingling with his whiskers, projected the long spiked spine of the big fish. Down from the other side of that ferocious head dangled the fish's tail, and from above the remarkable effect thus produced shot the intolerable glare of two yellow eyes. To the gaze of Duke, still blurred by slumber, this monstrosity was all of one piece. The bone seemed a living part of it. What he saw was like those interesting insect faces which the magnifying glass reveals to great Monsieur Fabre. It was impossible for Duke to maintain the philosophic calm of Monsieur Fabre, however. There was no magnifying glass between him and this spined and spiky face. Indeed, Duke was not in a position to think the matter over quietly. If he had been able to do that, he would have said to himself, We have here an animal of most peculiar and unattractive appearance, though upon examination it seems to be only a cat stealing a fishbone. Nevertheless, as the thief is large beyond all my recollection of cats and has an unpleasant stare, I will leave this spot at once. On the contrary, Duke was so electrified by his horrid awakening that he completely lost his presence of mind. In the very instant of his first eye's opening, the other eye and his mouth behaved similarly, the latter loosing upon the quiet air one shriek of mental agony before the little dog scrambled to his feet and gave further employment to his voice in a frenzy of profanity. At the same time, the subterranean diapason of a demoniac bass viol was heard. It rose to a wail and rose and rose again till it screamed like a small siren. It was Gypsy's war cry, and at the sound of it, Duke became a frothing maniac. He made a convulsive frontal attack upon the hobgoblin, and the massacre began. Never releasing the fishbone for an instant, Gypsy laid back his ears in a chilling way, beginning to shrink into himself like a concertina, but rising amidships so high that he appeared to be giving an imitation of that peaceful beast, the dromedary. Such was not his purpose, however, for, having attained his greatest possible altitude, he partially sat down and elevated his right arm after the manner of a semaphore. The semaphore arm remained rigid for a second, threatening, then it vibrated with inconceivable rapidity, fainting. But it was the treacherous left that did the work. Seemingly, this left gave Duke three lightning little pats upon the right ear, but the change in his voice indicated that these were no love taps. He yelled, Help! And bloody murder! Never had such a shattering uproar, all vocal, broken out upon a peaceful afternoon. Gypsy possessed a vocabulary for cat swearing, certainly second to none out of Italy, and probably equal to the best there, while Duke remembered and uttered things he had not thought of for years. The hum of the carpenter's shop ceased, and Sam Williams appeared in the stable doorway. He stared insanely. "'My gory!' he shouted. "'Duke's having a fight with the biggest cat you ever saw in your life. Come on!' His feet were already in motion toward the battlefield, with Penrod and Herman hurrying in his wake. Onward they sped, and Duke was encouraged by the sight and sound of these reinforcements to increase his own outrageous clamors and to press home his attack. But he was ill-advised. This time it was the right arm of the semaphore that dipped, and Duke's honest nose was but too conscious of what happened in consequence. 
a lump of dirt struck the refuse can with violence, and Gypsy beheld the advance of overwhelming forces. They rushed upon him from two directions, cutting off the steps of the porch. Undaunted, the formidable cat raked Duke's nose again, somewhat more lingeringly, and prepared to depart with his fishbone. He had little fear for himself, because he was inclined to think that, unhampered, he could whip anything on earth. Still, things seemed to be growing rather warm, and he saw nothing to prevent his leaving. And though he could laugh, in the face of so unequal an antagonist as Duke, Gypsy felt that he was never at his best or able to do himself full justice unless he could perform that feline operation inaccurately known as spitting. To his notion, this was an absolute essential to combat. But as all cats of the slightest pretensions to technique perfectly understand, it can neither be well done nor produce the best effects unless the mouth be opened to its utmost capacity, so as to expose the beginnings of the alimentary canal, down which, at least that is the intention of the threat, the opposing party will soon be passing. And Gypsy could not open his mouth without relinquishing his fishbone. Therefore, on small accounts, he decided to leave the field to his enemies, and to carry the fishbone elsewhere. He took two giant leaps, the first landed him upon the edge of the porch. There, without an instant's pause, he gathered his fur-sheathed muscles, concentrated himself into one big steel spring, and launched himself superbly into space. He made a stirring picture, however brief, as he left the solid porch behind him and sailed upward on an ascending curve into the sunlit air. His head was proudly up. He was the incarnation of menacing power and of self-confidence. It is possible that the white fish's spinal column and flopping tail had interfered with his vision, and in launching himself he may have mistaken the dark round opening of the cistern for its dark round cover. In that case it was a leap calculated and executed with precision, for as the boys clamoured their pleased astonishment, Gypsy descended accurately into the orifice and passed majestically from public view, with the fishbone still in his mouth and his haughty head still high. There was a grand splash. End of Gypsy by Booth Tarkington Folk Tales of the Kazis by Mrs. Rafi Coffee Break Collection 36 Cats this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Victoria Sandals. How the Cat Came to Live with Man In olden times, Kamiao the Cat lived in the jungle with her brother the Tiger, who was king of the jungle. She was very proud of her high pedigree and anxious to display the family greatness and to live luxuriously according to the manner of families of high degree. But the tiger, although he was very famous abroad, was not at all mindful of the well-being and condition of his family and allowed them to be often in want. He himself, by his skill and great prowess, obtained the most delicate morsels for his own consumption, but as it involved trouble to bring booty home for his household, he preferred to leave what he did not want himself to rot on the roadside or to be eaten by any chance scavenger. Therefore, the royal larder was often very bare and empty. Thus the cat was reduced to great privations, but so jealous was she for the honour and good name of her house that, to hide her poverty from her friends and neighbours, she used to sneak out at night-time when nobody could see her in order to catch mice and frogs and other common vermin for food. Once she ventured to speak to her brother on the matter, asking him what glory there was in being king if family were obliged to work and fare like common folks. The tiger was so angered that she never dared to approach the subject again and she continued to live her hard life and to shield the family honour. One day the tiger was unwell, and a number of his neighbours came to inquire after his health. Desiring to entertain them with tobacco, according to custom, 
he shouted to his sister to light the hookah and to serve it round to the company. Now, even in the most ordinary household, it is very contrary to good breeding to order the daughter of the house to serve the hookah, and Kamyao felt the disgrace keenly, and, hoping to excuse herself, she answered that there was no fire left by which to light the hookah. This answer displeased the tiger greatly, for he felt that his authority was being flouted before his friends. He ordered his sister angrily to go to the dwelling of mankind to fetch a firebrand with which to light the hookah, and, fearing to be punished if she disobeyed, the cat ran off as she was bidden and came to the dwelling of mankind. Some little children were playing in the village, and when they saw Kamyao, they began to speak gently to her and to stroke her fur. This was so pleasant to her feelings after the harsh treatment from her brother that she forgot all about the firebrand and stayed to play with the children, purring to show her pleasure. Meanwhile, the tiger and his friends sat waiting impatiently for the hookah that never came. It was considered a great privilege to draw a whiff from the royal hookah, but seeing that the cat delayed her return, the visitors took their departure and showed a little sullenness at not receiving any mark of hospitality in their king's house. The tiger's anger against his sister was very violent, and, regardless of his ill health, he went out in search of her. Kimiao heard him coming and knew from his growl that he was angry. She suddenly remembered her forgotten errand and hastily snatching a firebrand from the hearth, she started for home. Her brother met her on the way and began to abuse her, threatening to beat her, upon which she threw down the firebrand at his feet in her fright and ran back to the abode of mankind, where she has remained ever since, supporting herself as of old by catching frogs and mice and purring to the touch of little children. End of How the Cat Came to Live with Man by Mrs. Rafi The Story of Little Black Sambo by Helen Bannerman First published in 1899 Coffee Break Collection 36 Cats This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in March 2023. Preface There is very little to say about the story of Little Black Sambo. Once upon a time there was an English lady in India, where black children abound and tigers are everyday affairs, who had two little girls. To amuse these little girls, she used now and then to invent stories, for which, being extremely talented, she also drew and colored the pictures. Among these stories, Little Black Sambo, which was made up on a long railway journey, was the favorite, and it has been put into a dumpy book, and the pictures copied as exactly as possible, in the hope that you will like it as much as the two little girls did. THE STORY OF LITTLE BLACK SAMBO Once upon a time there was a little black boy, and his name was Little Black Sambo. And his mother was called Black Mumbo, and his father was called Black Jumbo. And Black Mumbo made him a beautiful little red coat and a pair of beautiful little blue trousers. And Black Jumbo went to the bazaar and bought him a beautiful green umbrella and a lovely little pair of purple shoes with crimson soles and crimson linings. And then wasn't Little Black Sambo grand? So he put on all his fine clothes and went out for a walk in the jungle. And by and by he met a tiger. And the tiger said to him, Little Black Sambo, I'm going to eat you up. And Little Black Sambo said, Oh, please, Mr. Tiger, don't eat me up, and I'll give you my beautiful little red coat. So the tiger said, Very well, I won't eat you this time, but you must give me your beautiful little red coat. So the tiger got poor Little Black Sambo's beautiful little red coat, and he went away saying, now I'm the grandest tiger in the jungle. 
and little black sambo went on and by and by he met another tiger and it said to him little black sambo i'm going to eat you up and little black sambo said oh please mr tiger don't eat me up i'll give you my beautiful little blue trousers so the tiger said very well i won't eat you this time but you must give me your beautiful little blue trousers so the tiger got poor little black sambo's beautiful little blue trousers and went away saying now i'm the grandest tiger in the jungle and little black sambo went on and by and by he met another tiger and it said to him little black sambo i'm going to eat you up and little black sambo said oh please mr tiger don't eat me up and i'll give you my beautiful little purple shoes with crimson soles and crimson linings but the tiger said what use would your shoes be to me i've got four feet and you've got only two you haven't got enough shoes for me but little black sambo said you could wear them on your ears so i could said the tiger that's a very good idea give them to me and i won't eat you this time so the tiger got poor little black sambo's beautiful little purple shoes with crimson soles and crimson linings and went away saying now i'm the grandest tiger in the jungle and by and by little black sambo met another tiger and it said to him little black sambo i'm going to eat you up and little black sambo said oh please mr tiger don't eat me up and i'll give you my beautiful green umbrella but the tiger said how can i carry an umbrella when i need all my paws for walking with ah uh, you could tie a knot on your tail and carry it that way said little black sambo so i could said the tiger give it to me and i won't eat you this time so he got poor little black sambo's beautiful green umbrella and went away saying now i'm the grandest tiger in the jungle and poor little black sambo went away crying because the cruel tigers had taken all his fine clothes presently he heard a horrible noise that sounded like grrr, rrr, 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 and it got louder and louder oh dear said little black sambo there are all the tigers coming back to eat me up what shall i do so he ran quickly to a palm tree and peeped around it to see what the matter was and there he saw all the tigers fighting and disputing which of them was the grandest and at last they all got so angry that they jumped up and took off all the fine clothes and began to tear each other with their claws and bite each other with their great big white teeth and they came rolling and tumbling right to the foot of the very tree where little black sambo was hiding but he jumped quickly in behind the umbrella and the tigers all caught hold of each other's tails as they wrangled and scrambled and so they found themselves in a ring around the tree then when the tigers were very wee and very far away little black sambo jumped up and called out oh tigers why have you taken off all your nice clothes don't you want them any more but the tigers only answered Grrr, then little black sambo said if you want them say so or i'll take them away but the tigers would not let go of each other's tails and so they could only say Grrr, so little black sambo put on all his fine clothes again and walked off 
and the tigers were very very angry but still they would not let go of each other's tails and they were so angry that they ran round the tree trying to eat each other up and they ran faster and faster till they were whirling round so fast that you couldn't see their legs at all and they still ran faster and faster and faster till they all just melted away and there was nothing left but a great big pool of melted butter or ghee as it is called in india round the foot of the tree now black jumbo was just coming home from his work with a great big brass pot in his arms and when he saw what was left of all the tigers he said oh what lovely melted butter i'll take that home to black mumbo for her to cook with so he put it all in the great big brass pot and took it home to black mumbo to cook with when black mumbo saw the melted butter wasn't she pleased now said she we'll all have pancakes for supper so she got flour and eggs and milk and sugar and butter and she made a huge big plate of the most lovely pancakes and she fried them in the melted butter which the tigers had made and they were just as yellow and brown as little tigers and then they all sat down to supper and black mumbo ate twenty-seven pancakes and black jumbo ate fifty-five but little black sambo ate one hundred and sixty-nine because he was so hungry End of the story of Little Black Sambo. The Master Cat or Puss in Boots by Charles Perrault. Coffee Break Collection 36. Cats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caveat. The Master Cat or Puss in Boots There was a miller who left no estate to the three sons he had than his mill, his ass, and his cat. The partition was soon made. Neither the scrivener nor attorney were sent for. They would have soon eaten up all the poor patrimony. The eldest had the mill, the second the ass, and the youngest nothing but the cat. The poor young fellow was quite comfortless at having so poor a lot. My brothers, said he, must get their living handsomely enough by joining their stocks together. But for my part, when I have eaten my cat and made a muff of his skin, I must die with hunger. The cat, who heard all this, but made as if he did not, said to him with a grave and serious air, Do not thus afflict yourself, my good master. You have only to give me a bag and get a pair of boots made for me, that I may scamper through the dirt and the brambles and you shall see that you have not such a bad portion of me as you imagine. Though the cat's master did not build very much upon what he said, he had, however, often seen him play a great many cunning tricks to catch rats and mice, as when he used to hang up by the heels or hide himself in the meal, and make it as if he were dead. So he did not altogether despair of his affording him some help in his miserable condition. When the cat had what he asked for, he booted himself very gallantly, and putting his bag about his neck, he held the strings of it in his two forepaws, and went into a warren, where was a great abundance of rabbits. He put bran and sow thistle into his bag, and stretching himself out at length, as if he would have been dead, he waited for some young rabbit, not quite acquainted with the deceits of the world, to come and rummage his bag for what he had put into it. Scarce was he lain down, but he had what he wanted. A rash and foolish young rabbit jumped into his bag, and Monsieur Puss, immediately drawing close the strings, took and killed him without pity. Proud of his prey, he went with it to the palace, and asked to speak with his majesty. He was showed upstairs into the king's apartment, and made a low reverence, and said to him, I have brought for you, sir, a rabbit of the warren, which my noble lord, the Marquis of Carabas, for that was the title the Puss was pleased to give his master, has commanded me to present to your majesty from him. "'Tell thy master,' said the king, "'that I thank him, and that he does me a great deal of pleasure.' Another time he went and hid himself among some standing corn, 
holding still his bag open, and when a brace of partridges ran into it, he drew the strings, and so caught them both. He went and made a present of these to the king, as he had done before of the rabbit, which he took in the warren. The king, in like manner, received the partridges with great pleasure, and ordered him some money to drink. The cat continued for two or three months, thus to carry his majesty from time to time game of his master's taking. One day in particular, when he knew for certain that the king was, fa was to take the air along the riverside with his daughter, the most beautiful princess in the world, he said to his master, If you will follow my advice, your fortune is made. You have nothing else to do but go and wash yourself in the river. In that part I shall show you and leave the rest to me. The Marquis of Calabas did what the cat advised him to do, without knowing why or wherefore. While he was washing, the king passed by, and the cat began to cry out as loud as he could, Help! Help! My Lord Marquis of Carabas is drowning! At this noise the king put his head out of his coach window, and finding it was the cat who had so often brought him such good game, he commanded his guards to run immediately to the assistance of his lordship, the Marquis of Carabas. While they were drawing the poor Marquis out of the river, the cat came up to the coach and told the king that while his master was washing, there came by some rogues who went off with his clothes, though he had cried out, Thieves! Thieves! several times, as loud as he could. This cunning cat had hidden them under a great stone. The king immediately commanded the officers of his wardrobe to run and fetch one of his best suits for the Lord Marquis of Calabas. The king received him with great kindness, and as the fine clothes he had been given extremely set off his good mien, for he was well made and very handsome in his person. The king's daughter took a secret inclination to him, and the Marquis of Carabas had no sooner cast two or three respectful and somewhat tender glances, but she fell in love with him to distraction. The king would needs have him come into his coach and take part of the airing. The cat, quite overjoyed to see his project begin to succeed, marched on before, and meeting with some countrymen who were mowing a meadow, he said to them, "'Good people, you who are mowing,' If you do not tell the king that the meadow you mow belongs to my lord Marquis of Carabas, you should be chopped as small as mincemeat. The king did not fail asking of the mowers to whom the meadow they were mowing belonged. To my lord Marquis of Carabas, answered they all together, for the cat's threats had been made them dreadfully afraid. Truly a fine estate, said the king to the Marquis of Carabas. You see, sir, said the Marquis, this is a meadow which never fails to yield a plentiful harvest every year. The master cat, who still went on before, met with some reapers and said to them, Good people, you who are reaping, if you do not tell the king that this corn belongs to the Marquis of Carabas, you should be chopped as small as mincemeat. The king, who passed by a moment after, would needs know to whom all that corn, which he then saw, did belong. To my lord Marquis of Carabas, replied the reapers, and the king again congratulated the Marquis. The master cat, who always went before, said the same words to all he met, and the king was astonished at the vast estate of my lord Marquis of Carabas. Monsieur Puss came at last to a stately castle, the master of which was an ogre, the richest had ever been known, for all the lands which the king had gone over belonged to this castle. The cat, who had taken care to inform himself who this ogre was, and what he could do, asked to speak with him, saying he could not pass so near a castle without having the honour of paying his respects to him. The ogre received him as civilly as an ogre could do, and made him sit down. "'I have been assured,' said the cat, "'that you have the gift of being able to change yourself into all sorts of creatures you have a mind to. You can, for example, transform yourself into a lion or elephant and the like.' "'This is true,' answered the ogre very briskly, "'and to convince you, you shall now see me become a lion.' Puss was so dreadfully terrified at the sight of a lion so near him, that he immediately got into the gutter, not without abundance of trouble and danger because of his boots, which were ill-suited for walking upon the tiles. A little while after, when Puss saw that the ogre had resumed his natural form, he came down and owned he had been very much frightened. "'I have been, moreover, informed,' said the cat, "'but I know not how to believe it, that you have also the power to take on you the shape of the smallest animals. For example, to change yourself into a rat or a mouse.' "'but I must own to you, I take this to be impossible.' "'Impossible!' cried the ogre. "'You shall see that presently.' "'And at the same time changed into a mouse "'and began to run about the floor. "'Puss no sooner perceived this, "'but he fell upon him and ate him up. "'Meanwhile the king, who saw as he passed "'this fine castle of the ogres, "'had a mind to go into it, 
Puss, who heard the noise of his majesty's coach running over the drawbridge, ran out and said to the king, Your majesty is welcome to this castle of my lord Marquis of Carabas. What, my lord Marquis, cried the king, does this castle also belong to you? There can be nothing finer than this court and all the stately buildings which surround it. Let's go into it, if you please. The Marquis gave his hand to the princess and followed the king, who went up first. They passed into a spacious hall, where they found a magnificent collation which the ogre had prepared for his friends, who were that very day to visit him, but dared not enter, knowing that the king was there. His Majesty was perfectly charmed with the good qualities of my lord Marquis of Carabas, as was his daughter, who had fallen violently in love with him, and seeing the vast estate he possessed, said to him after having drank five or six glasses, It will be owing to yourself only, my lord Marquis, if you are not my son-in-law. The Marquis, making several low bows, accepted the honour which His Majesty conferred upon him, and forthwith, that very same day, married the Princess. Puss became a great lord, and never ran after mice any more, but only for his diversion. The Moral How advantageous it may be, by long descent of pedigree, to enjoy a great estate! Yet knowledge how to act we see, joined with consummate industry, nor wonder ye thereat, doth often prove a greater boon, as should be two young people know. Another. If the son of a miller so soon gains the heart of a beautiful princess, and makes her him part, sweet languishing glances, eyes melting for love, it must be remarked of fine clothes how they move, and that youth, a good face, a good air, with good mien, are not always in different mediums to win. The love of the fair and gently inspire the flames of sweet passion and tender desire. End of The Master Cat or Puss in Boots by Charles Perrault Mezzo Forte A poem by William Carlos Williams Coffee Break Collection 36 Cats Mezzo forte. Take that, damn you, and that, and here's a rose to make it right again. God knows I'm sorry, Grace, but then, it's not my fault if you will be a cat. End of Mezzo forte by William Carlos Williams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Milk for the Cat by Harold Monroe Coffee Break Collection 36 Cats When the tea is brought at five o'clock And all the neat curtains are drawn with care The little black cat with bright green eyes Is suddenly purring there. At first she pretends having nothing to do. She has come in merely to blink by the grate. But... Though tea may be late, or the milk may be sour, she is never late. And presently her agate eyes take a soft, large, milky haze, and her independent casual glance becomes a stiff, hard gaze. Then she stamps her claws, or lifts her ears, or twists her tail and begins to stir, till suddenly all her lithe body becomes one breathing trembling purr the children eat and wriggle and laugh the two old ladies stroke their silk but the cat is grown small and thin with desire transformed to a creeping lust for milk the white saucer like some full moon descends at last, from the clouds of the table above, she sighs and dreams and thrills and glows, transfigured with love. She nestles over the shining rim, buries her chin in the creamy sea. Her tail hangs loose, each drowsy paw is doubled under each bending knee. A long Dim ecstasy holds her life. Her world is an infinite shapeless white, Till her tongue has curled the last holy drop, Then she sinks back into the night, Draws and dips her 
body to a heap, her sleepy nerves in the great armchair, lies defeated and buried deep, three or four hours unconscious there. End of Milk for the Cat by Harold Monroe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Tompkins, an excerpt from Chapter 17 of The Education of Uncle Paul by Algernon Blackwood. Coffee Break Collection 36, Cats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mrs. Tompkins The psychology of sleep being apparently beyond all intelligible explanation, it was not surprising that Uncle Paul woke up the next morning as though he had gone to bed without a single perplexity. He remembered none of the thoughts that had thronged his brain a few short hours before. Perhaps they had all slipped down into the region of submerged consciousness to crop out later in natural and apparently spontaneous action. At any rate, he remembered little enough of his troubles when he woke and saw the fair English sun streaming in through the open windows. Odors of woods and dew-drenched lawns came into the room, and the birds were singing with noise enough to waken all the countryside. It was impossible to lie in bed. He was up and dressed long before any servant came to call him. Downstairs he found the house in darkness, doors barred and windows heavily shuttered, as though the house had expected an attack. Not a soul was stirring. The air was close and musty. The idea of having to strike a match in a country house at 6 a.m. somehow oppressed him. Not knowing his way about very well yet, he stumbled across the hall to find a door, and as he did so, something soft came rubbing against his legs. He put his hand down in the darkness and felt a furry, warm body and a stiff, upright tail that reached almost to his knees. The thing began to purr. "'I declare,' he exclaimed, "'Mrs. Tompkins!' And he struck a match and followed her to the drawing-room door. A moment later they had unfastened the shutters of the French window, Mrs. Tompkins assisting by standing on her hind legs and tapping the swinging bell, and made their way out on to the lawn. The sunshine came slanting between the cedars and lay in shining strips on the grass. Everything glistened with dew. The air was sweet and fresh, as it only is in the early hours after the dawn. Very faintly, as though its mind was not yet made up, the air stirred among the bushes. Paul's first impulse was to waken the entire household so that they might share with him this first glory of the morning. Probably they don't know how splendid it is. The thought of the sleeping family, many of them perhaps with closed windows, missing all this wonder, was a positive pain to him. But fortunately for himself, he decided it might be better not to begin his visit in this way. "'I guess you and I, Mrs. Tompkins, are the only people about,' he said, looking down at the beautiful gray creature that sniffed the air calmly at his feet. "'Come on, then. Let's make a raid together on the woods.' He threw a disdainful glance at the sleeping house. No smoke came from the chimneys. Most of the upper windows were closed. A delicious fragrance stole out of the woods to meet him as he strolled across the wet lawn. He felt like a schoolboy, doing something out of bounds. "'You lead and I follow,' he said, addressing his companion in mischief. And at once his attention became absorbed in the animal's characteristic behavior. Obviously it was delighted to be with him, yet it did not wish him to think so, or if he did think so, to give any sign of the fact. Nothing could have been plainer. First it crept along by the stone wall, delicately, with its body very close to the ground, as though the weight of the atmosphere oppressed it, and when he spoke it turned its head with an affectation of genuine surprise, as though it would say, "'You here? I thought I was alone.' 
then it sat down on the gravel path and began to wash its face and paws till he had passed after which when he was not looking of course it followed him condescendingly sniffing at blades of grass and rout without actually touching them and flicking its tail upwards with sudden electric jerks paul understood in a general way what was expected of him he watched it surreptitiously pretending to examine the flowers for this he knew was the great cat game of elaborate pretense and mrs tompkins true adept in the art played up wonderfully and incidentally taught him much about the ways and methods of simple disguise it advanced stealthily when he wasn't looking it stopped to wash or gaze into the air the moment he turned it was very shy and very affected and very self-conscious inimitable was the way it kept to all the little rules of the game it walked daintily down the path after him shaking the dew from its paws with a rapid quivering motion then suddenly arching its back as though momentarily offended at nothing it stared up at him with an expression that seemed to question his very existence i guess i ought to fade away when you look at me like that was his thought i'm here i'm coming mrs tompkins he felt constrained to remark aloud before going forward again the grand morning excites my blood just as much as it excites your own it seemed necessary to assert his presence no intelligent person can be conceited long in the presence of a cat no living creature can so sublimely ignore but paul was not conceited he continued to watch it with delight one very important rule of the game appeared to be that plenty of bushes were necessary by way of cover so that it could pretend it was not really coming farther than that particular bush where it was hiding at the moment instinctively he never made the grave mistake of calling it to follow and though it never trotted alongside being always either behind or in front of him the presence of the cat in his immediate neighbourhood provided all sorts of company imaginable it had also provided him with an opportunity to play the hero then suddenly the calm and peace of the morning was disturbed by a scene of strange violence mrs tompkins with spread legs dashed past him at a surprising speed and flew up the trunk of a big tree as though all the dogs in the county were at her heels from this position of vantage she looked back over her shoulder with hysterical and frightened eyes there was a great show of terror a vast noise of claws upon the bark no actress could have created better the atmosphere of immediate danger and alarm paul had an instinctive flair for this move of the game he made a great pretense of running up to save the cat from its awful position but of course long before he got there she had dropped laughingly to the earth again having thus impressed upon him the value of her life a question of life or death that time i think mrs tompkins he said soothingly trying to stroke her back i wonder if the head gardener's grandmother after whom you were named ever did this sort of thing i doubt it but the creature escaped from him easily for no one is ever caught in the true cat game it scuttled down the path at full speed in a sort of candor but sideways as though a violent wind blew it and desperate resistance was necessary to keep on its feet at all after that its self-consciousness seemed to disappear a little it behaved normally it stalked birds that showed however no fear of its approach it sniffed the tips of leaves it played baby fashion with various invisible companions and finally it vanished in a thick jungle of laurels to hunt in savage earnest and left paul to his own devices like all its kind it only wished to prove how charming it could be in order to emphasize later its utter independence of human sympathy and companionship. End of Mrs. Tompkins, an excerpt from The Education of Uncle Paul by Algernon Blackwood. For well, I will consider my cat Geoffrey by Christopher Smart. 
Coffee Break Collection 36 Cats Lines 695 to 768 from Fragment B of Jubilate Agno For I will consider my cat Geoffrey For he is the servant of the living God Duly and daily serving him For at the first glance of the glory of God in the east He worships in his way or is this done by wreathing his body seven times around with elegant quickness? From then he leaps up to catch the musk, which is the blessing of God upon his prayer. For he rolls upon prank to work it in. For having done duty and received blessing, he begins to consider himself. For this he performs in ten degrees. For first... He looks upon his forepaws to see if they are clean. For secondly, he kicks up behind to clear away there. For thirdly, he works it upon stretch with the forepaws extended. For fourthly, he sharpens his paws by wood. For fifthly, he washes himself. For sixthly, he rolls upon wash. For seventhly, he flees himself, that he may not be interrupted upon the beat. For eighthly, he rubs himself against a post. For ninthly, he looks up for his instructions. For tenthly, he goes in quest of food. For having considered God and himself, he will consider his neighbour. For if he meets another cat, he will kiss her in kindness. For when he takes his prey, he plays with it, to give it a chance. For one mouse in seven escapes by his dallying. For when his day's work is done, his business more properly begins. For he keeps the Lord's watch in the night against the adversary. For he counteracts the powers of darkness by his electrical skin and glaring eyes. For he counteracts the devil, who is death, by brisking about the life. For, in his morning orisons, he loves the sun, and the sun loves him. For he is of the tribe of Tiger. For the cherub cat is a term of the angel Tiger. For he has the subtlety and hissing of a serpent, which in goodness he suppresses. For he will not do destruction if he is well fed, neither will he spit without provocation. For he purrs in thankfulness when God tells him he's a good cat. For he is an instrument for the children to learn benevolence upon. For every house is incomplete without him, and a blessing is lacking in the spirit. For the Lord commanded Moses concerning the cats at the departure of the children of Israel from Egypt. For every family had one cat at least in the bag. For the English cats are the best in Europe. For he is the cleanest in the use of his forepaws of any quadruped. For the dexterity of his defence is an instance of the love of God to him exceedingly. For he is the quickest to his mark of any creature. For he is tenacious of his point. For he is a mixture of gravity and waggery. For he knows that God is his saviour. For there is nothing sweeter than his peace when at rest. For there is nothing brisker than his life when in motion. For he is of the Lord's poor, and so indeed is he called by benevolence perpetually, Poor Geoffrey, poor Geoffrey, the rat has bit thy throat. For I bless the name of the Lord Jesus, that Geoffrey is better. For the divine spirit comes about his body to sustain it, in complete cat. For his tongue is exceeding pure, so that it has in purity what it lacks in music. For he is docile, and can learn certain things. For he can sit up with gravity, which is patience upon approbation. For he can fetch and carry, which is patience in employment. For he can jump over a stick, which is patience upon proof positive. For he can spraggle upon waggle at the word of command. 
for he can jump from an eminence into his master's bosom, for he can catch the cork and toss it again, for he is hated by the hypocrite and miser, for the former is afraid of detection, for the latter refuses the charge, for he camels his back to bear the first notion of business, for he is good to think on, if a man would express himself neatly, for he made a great figure in Egypt for his signal services. For he killed the ichneumon rat, very pernicious by land. For his ears are so acute that they sting again. For from this proceeds the passing quickness of his attention. For by stroking of him I have found out electricity. For I perceived God's light about him, both wax and fire. For the electrical fire is the spiritual substance which God sends from heaven to sustain the bodies both of man and beast. For God has blessed him in the variety of his movements. For, though he cannot fly, he is an excellent clamberer. For his motions upon the face of the earth are more than any other quadruped. For he can tread to all the measures upon the music. For he can swim for life. For he can creep. End of For I Will Consider My Cat Geoffrey by Christopher Smart. Recording by Algie Pug. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Owl and the Pussycat by Edward Lear. Coffee Break Collection number 36. Cats. Read by Algie Pug. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea-green boat. They took some honey, and plenty of money, wrapped up in a five-pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above, and sang to a small guitar. O oh, lovely pussy, O oh, pussy, my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, you are, what a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, You elegant fowl! How charmingly sweet you sing! Oh, let us be married, too long we have tarried, but what shall we do for a ring? They sailed away, for a year and a day, to the land where the bong tree grows, and there in a wood a piggy wig stood, with a ring at the end of his nose, his nose, his nose, with a ring at the end of his nose. "'Dear pig, are you willing to sell for one shilling your ring?' said the piggy. "'Oh, you will.' So they took it away, and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mince and slices of quince, which they ate with a runcible spoon, and hand in hand, on the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon, the moon, the moon, they danced by the light of the moon.' End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poem 30 by Humbert Wolf From his book Kensington Gardens Coffee Break Collection 36 Cats Poem 30 A solitary Persian cat observed that she was looking at the stupid way in which mankind did all things always front behind. Here, for example, is a park clearly intended for the dark, she said, with ample latitude for stalking and procuring food. According to the ancient law, vide R. Kipling of tooth and claw, instead of which in Kensington, when that intrusive oaf, the sun, has had the decency to quit, what do they do along of it? So far from realizing that any self-respecting cat needs when she drifts, with her tail swishing, silence, as men do when they're fishing, they rush about in motor lorries, enough to frighten all the quarries in Europe, and they send up beams of light that does not shine but screams, and then the people I permit to share my flat are by with it, instead of seeing milk and fish is set according to my wish and that the maid has brushed my fur they read a wretched newspaper 
whose only use is that it slips easily round the fish and chips. But there, they will not listen. Hush, you will forgive me if I rush. An air raid warning? Planes are over? You and the mouse are taking cover. Let me, with Burns, remind you, then, the best laid plans of mice and men. End of poem 30 by Hubbard Wolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tobermory by Saki. Coffee Break Collection 36. Cats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winifred Aspen. Tobermory. It was a chill, rain washed afternoon of a late August day, that indefinite season when partridges are still in security or cold storage, and there is nothing to hunt unless one is bounded on the north by the Bristol Channel, in which case one may lawfully gallop after fat red stags. Lady Blemley's house party was not bounded on the north by the Bristol Channel. Hence there was a full gathering of her guests round the tea-table on this particular afternoon. And, in spite of the blankness of the season and the triteness of the occasion, there was no trace in the company of that fatigued restlessness which means a dread of the pianola and a subdued hankering for auction bridge. The undisguised, open-mouthed attention of the entire party was fixed on the homely negative personality of Mr. Cornelius Appin. Of all her guests, he was the one who had come to Lady Blemley with the vaguest reputation. Someone had said he was clever, and he had got his invitation in the moderate expectation on the part of his hostess that some portion, at least, of his cleverness would be contributed to the general entertainment. Until tea-time that day, she had been unable to discover in what direction, if any, his cleverness lay. He was neither a wit nor a croquet champion, a hypnotic force nor a begetter of amateur theatricals. Neither did his exterior suggest the sort of man in whom women are willing to pardon a generous measure of mental deficiency. He had subsided into mere Mr. Appen, and the Cornelius seemed a piece of transparent baptismal bluff. And now he was claiming to have launched on the world a discovery beside which the invention of gunpowder, of the printing press, and of steam locomotion were inconsiderable trifles. Science had made bewildering strides in many directions during recent decades, but this thing seemed to belong to the domain of miracle rather than to scientific achievement. "'And do you really ask us to believe?' Sir Wilfrid was saying, that you have discovered a means for instructing animals in the art of human speech, and that dear old Tobermory has proved your first successful pupil? It is a problem at which I have worked for the last seventeen years, said Mr. Appin, but only during the last eight or nine months have I been rewarded with glimmerings of success. Of course I have experimented with thousands of animals, but latterly only with cats, those wonderful creatures which have assimilated themselves so marvellously with our civilization, while retaining all their highly developed feral instincts. Here and there, among cats, one comes across an outstanding superior intellect, just as one does among the ruck of human beings, and when I made the acquaintance of Tobermory a week ago, I saw at once that I was in contact with a beyond cat of extraordinary intelligence. I had gone far along the road to success in recent experiments, with Tobermory, as you call him, I have reached the goal. Mr. Appen concluded his remarkable statement in a voice which he strove to divest of a triumphant inflection. No one said, rats, though Clovis's lips moved in a monosyllabic contortion which probably invoked those rodents of disbelief. And do you mean to say, asked Miss Resker after a slight pause, that you have taught Tobermory to say and understand easy sentences of one syllable? My dear Miss Resker, said the wonder worker patiently, one teaches little children and savages and backward adults in that piecemeal fashion. When one has once solved the problem of making a beginning with an animal of highly developed intelligence, one has no need for those halting methods. Tobermory can speak our language with perfect correctness. This time Clovis very distinctly said, beyond rats. 
Sir Wilfrid was more polite, but equally sceptical. "'Hadn't we better have the cat in and judge for ourselves?' suggested Lady Blemley. Sir Wilfrid went in search of the animal, and the company settled themselves down to the languid expectation of witnessing some more or less adroit drawing-room ventriloquism. In a minute, Sir Wilfrid was back in the room, his face white beneath its tan, and his eyes dilated with excitement. "'By gad, it's true!' His agitation was unmistakably genuine, and his hearers started forward in a thrill of awakened interest. Collapsing into an armchair, he continued breathlessly, "'I found him dozing in the smoking room and called out to him to come for his tea. He blinked at me in his usual way, and I said, "'Come on, Toby, don't keep us waiting.' And by gad, he drawled out in a most horribly natural voice that he'd come when he dashed well pleased. I nearly jumped out of my skin. Appen had preached to absolutely incredulous hearers. Sir Wilfrid's statement carried instant conviction. A babel-like chorus of startled exclamation arose, amid which the scientist sat mutely enjoying the first fruit of his stupendous discovery. In the midst of the clamour, Tobermory entered the room and made his way with velvet tread and studied unconcern across to the group seated round the tea-table. A sudden hush of awkwardness and constraint fell on the company. Somehow there seemed an element of embarrassment in addressing on equal terms a domestic cat of acknowledged dental ability. "'Will you have some milk, Tobermory?' asked Lady Blemley in a rather strained voice. "'I don't mind if I do,' was the response." couched in a tone of even indifference. A shiver of suppressed excitement went through the listeners, and Lady Blemley might be excused for pouring out the saucer full of milk rather unsteadily. "'I'm afraid I've spilt a good deal of it,' she said apologetically. "'After all, it's not my axe, Minster,' was Tobermory's rejoinder. Another silence fell on the group, and then Miss Resker, in her best district visitor manner, asked if the human language had been difficult to learn." Tobermory looked squarely at her for a moment, and then fixed his gaze serenely on the middle distance. It was obvious that boring questions lay outside his scheme of life. "'What do you think of human intelligence?' asked Mavis Pellington lamely. "'Of whose intelligence in particular?' asked Tobermory coldly. "'Oh, well, mine, for instance,' said Mavis with a feeble laugh. "'You put me in an embarrassing position,' said Tobermory, whose tone and attitude certainly did not suggest a shred of embarrassment. When your inclusion in this house party was suggested, Sir Wilfrid protested that you were the most brainless woman of his acquaintance, and that there was a wide distinction between hospitality and the care of the feeble-minded. Lady Blemley replied that your lack of brain power was the precise quality which had earned you your invitation, as you were the only person she could think of who might be idiotic enough to buy their old car. You know, the one they called the Envy of Sisyphus, because it goes quite nicely uphill if you push it. Lady Blemley's protestations would have had greater effect if she had not casually suggested to Mavis, only that morning, that the car in question would be just the thing for her down at her Devonshire home. Major Barfield plunged in heavily to effect a diversion. How about your carryings on with the tortoiseshell puss up at the stables, eh? The moment he had said it, everyone realized the blunder. One does not usually discuss these matters in public, said Tobermory frigidly. From a slight observation of your ways, since you've been in this house, I should imagine you'd find it inconvenient if I were to shift the conversation onto your own little affairs. The panic which ensued was not confined to the Major. Would you like to go and see if Cook has got your dinner ready? suggested Lady Blemley hurriedly, affecting to ignore the fact that it wanted at least two hours to Tobermory's dinner time. Thanks, said Tobermory. Not quite so soon after my tea. I don't want to die of indigestion. Cats have nine lives, you know, said Sir Wilfrid heartily. Possibly, answered Tobermory, but only one liver. Adelaide, said Mrs. Cornett, do you mean to encourage that cat to go out and gossip about us in the servants' hall? The panic had indeed become general. A narrow ornamental balustrade ran in front of most of the bedroom windows at the towers, and it was recalled with dismay that this had formed a favourite promenade for Tobermory at all hours, whence he could watch the pigeons, and heaven knew what else besides. 
If he intended to become reminiscent in his present outspoken strain, the effect would be something more than disconcerting. Mrs. Cornette, who spent much time at her toilette table, and whose complexion was reputed to be of a nomadic though punctual disposition, looked as ill at ease as the major. Miss Scrawen, who wrote fiercely sensuous poetry and led a blameless life, merely displayed irritation. If you are methodical and virtuous in private, you don't necessarily want everyone to know it. Bertie von Tan, who was so depraved at seventeen that he had long ago given up trying to be any worse, turned a dull shade of gardenia white, but he did not commit the error of dashing out of the room like Odo Finsbury, a young gentleman who was understood to be reading for the church and who was possibly disturbed at the thought of scandals he might hear concerning other people. Clovis had the presence of mind to maintain a composed exterior. Privately, he was calculating how long it would take to procure a box of fancy mice through the agency of the exchange and mart as a species of hush money. Even in a delicate situation like the present, Agnes Resker could not endure to remain too long in the background. Why did I ever come down here? she asked dramatically. Obermory immediately accepted the opening. Judging by what you said to Mrs. Cornette on the croquet lawn yesterday, you were out for food. You described the Blemleys as the dullest people to stay with that you knew, but said they were clever enough to employ a first-rate cook. Otherwise, they'd find it difficult to get anyone to come down a second time. There's not a word of truth in it. I appeal to Mrs. Cornett, exclaimed the discomfited Agnes. Mrs. Cornett repeated your remark afterwards to Bertie von Tan, continued Tobermory, and said that woman is a regular hunger marcher. She'd go anywhere for four square meals a day. And Bertie von Tan said... At this point, the chronicle mercifully ceased. Tobermory had caught a glimpse of the big yellow tong from the rectory, working his way through the shrubbery towards the stable wing. In a flash, he had vanished through the open French window. With the disappearance of his too brilliant pupil, Cornelius Appen found himself beset by a hurricane of bitter upbraiding, anxious inquiry, and frightened entreaty. The responsibility for the situation lay with him, and he must prevent matters from becoming worse. Could Tobermory impart his dangerous gift to other cats? was the first question he had to answer. It was possible, he replied, that he might have initiated his intimate friend, the stable puss, into his new accomplishment, but it was unlikely that his teaching could have taken a wider range as yet. Then, said Mrs. Cornett, Tobermory may be a valuable cat and a great pet, but I'm sure you'll agree, Adelaide, that both he and the stable cat must be done away with without delay. You don't suppose I've enjoyed the last quarter of an hour, do you? said Lady Blemley bitterly. My husband and I are very fond of Tobermory, at least we were before this horrible accomplishment was infused into him. But now, of course, the only thing is to have him destroyed as soon as possible. We can put some strychnine in the scraps he always gets at dinner time, said Sir Wilfrid, and I will go and drown the stable cat myself. The coachman will be very sore at losing his pet, but I'll say a very catching form of mange has broken out in both cats, and we're afraid of it spreading to the kennels. But my great discovery, expostulated Mr. Appen, after all my years of research and experiment. You can go and experiment on the shorthorns at the farm who are under proper control, said Mrs. Cornett, or the elephants at the zoological gardens. They're said to be highly intelligent, and they have this recommendation, that they don't come creeping about our bedrooms and under chairs and so forth. An archangel ecstatically proclaiming the millennium, and then finding that it clashed unpardonably with Henley and would have to be indefinitely postponed, could hardly have felt more crestfallen than Cornelius Appen at the reception of his wonderful achievement. Public opinion, however, was against him. In fact, had the general voice been consulted on the subject, it is probable that a strong minority vote would have been in favour of including him in the strychnine diet. Defective train arrangements and a nervous desire to see matters brought to a finish prevented an immediate dispersal of the party, but dinner that evening was not a social success. Sir Wilfrid had had a rather trying time with the stable cat, and subsequently with the coachman. Agnes Resker ostentatiously limited her repast to a morsel of dry toast, which she bit as though it were a personal enemy, while Mavis Pellington maintained a vindictive silence throughout the meal. Lady Blemley kept up a flow of what she hoped was conversation, but her attention was fixed on the doorway. 
A plateful of carefully dosed fish scraps was in readiness on the sideboard, but sweets and savory and dessert went their way, and no Tobermory appeared either in the dining room or kitchen. The sepulchral dinner was cheerful compared with the subsequent vigil in the smoking room. Eating and drinking had at least supplied a distraction and cloak to the prevailing embarrassment. Bridge was out of the question in the general tension of nerves and tempers, and after Odo Finsbury had given a lugubrious rendering of Melisande in the wood to a frigid audience, music was tacitly avoided. At eleven the servants went to bed, announcing that the small window in the pantry had been left open as usual for Tobermory's private use. The guests read steadily through the current batch of magazines and fell back gradually on the badminton library and bound volumes of punch. Lady Blemley made periodic visits to the pantry, returning each time with an expression of listless depression which forestalled questioning. At two o'clock, Clovis broke the dominating silence. He won't turn up tonight. He's probably in the local newspaper office at the present moment, dictating the first installment of his reminiscences. Lady What's-Her-Name's book won't be in it. It will be the event of the day. Having made this contribution to the general cheerfulness, Clovis went to bed. At long intervals, the various members of the house party followed his example. The servants, taking round the early tea, made a uniform announcement in reply to a uniform question. Tobermory had not returned. Breakfast was, if anything, a more unpleasant function than dinner had been. But before its conclusion, the situation was relieved. Tobermory's corpse was brought in from the shrubbery, where a gardener had just discovered it. From the bites on his throat and the yellow fur which coated his claws, it was evident that he had fallen in unequal combat with the big tom from the rectory. By midday, most of the guests had quitted the towers, and after lunch, Lady Blemley had sufficiently recovered her spirits to write an extremely nasty letter to the rectory about the loss of her valuable pet. Tobermory had been Appin's one successful pupil, and he was destined to have no successor. A few weeks later, an elephant in the Dresden Zoological Garden, which had shown no previous signs of irritability, broke loose and killed an Englishman who had apparently been teasing it. The victim's name was variously reported in the papers as Oppen and Eppelin, but his front name was faithfully rendered Cornelius. "'If he was trying German irregular verbs on the poor beast,' said Clovis, "'he deserved all he got.'" End of Tobermory by Saki The Adventures of Whittington and His Cat Coffee Break Collection, 36 Cats Recording by Elsie Selwyn The Adventures of Whittington and His Cat Some hundred miles from London town There dwelt a country lad His parents they were dead and gone Which made him very sad To London then he bent his way where, he had oft been told, the streets so broad, so fine and gay, were paved with shining gold. Arrived in town, no gold he found, his feet were tired and sore. He sat himself upon the ground, close to a merchant's door. Just now the merchant he came home, and on his steps behold, poor Whittington lay comfortless, he hungry was and cold. The merchant took him in his house, so bad poor Dick did look, and bade him to the kitchen go to help his maid, the cook. Here Dick was fed and warmed so well, his heart it felt quite light, but cook she beat and scolded him from morning until night. Dick's bed did in a garret lay, where rats and mice did creep. They ran by night as well as day, so Dick could get no sleep. One day he saw a woman pass, a cat she had to sell. A penny was the price she asked, which suited him quite well. In peace Dick now could sleep at night. The rats were driven away, but Cook she scolded, right or wrong, he had no peace by day. A ship his master sent abroad with goods to sell, and that, as every servant something sent, poor Dick must send his cat. His troubles now afresh did rise by night as well as day, until at last with tearful eyes poor Dick he ran away. 
to holloway he travelled on bow bells did ring and he while listening thought they said to him thrice london's mayor you'll be the ship in which dick's cat was sent arrived on barbary's coast where mice and rats the king annoyed they were a mighty host on board they sent and brought dick's cat as fast as they were able soon every mouse and every rat were cleared from off the table this pleased much the king and queen to them the cat was sold the captain brought to whittington a chest quite full of gold a merchant now he soon became and lived in great renown three times lord mayor he chosen was of london's famous town end of the adventures of whittington and his cat recording by elsie selwyn this librivox recording is in the public domain